Okay, here we go with everybody's favorite topics, fluids and electrolytes. So I'm going to try and make this fairly simple, and it may be too basic for some people, but I found that the simple approach tends to make it a lot clearer for people who are uh, several years, let's say several years away from medical school where we actually learned all this stuff. All right, starting out with balance in the human body. The human body lives in an exquisite balance every day. Uh, unless there's some disruption due to renal failure or disease process, uh, we live in a balance where we take in about 2,600 milliliters a day and we put out about 2,600 milliliters a day. Now the intake come, or the output comes 1,500 milliliters from the kidneys, 600 from the skin. So actually when you're, you're sweating process and what we call skin respiration, actually you lose about 600 milliliters a day. About 400 milliliters comes just from breathing, so in and out of the lungs, and about 100 milliliters is associated with the feces. Uh, the intake, 1,500 milliliters in fluids, 800 milliliters in solid foods, and then the last one, 300 milliliters, if you remember the Krebs cycle where every time you went ADP to ATP, water spun off, well in the course of a day, those sort of metabolic processes result in another 300 milliliters through what we call the water of oxidation. Now the fluid in the human body exists in two compartments. We have the intracellular compartment, and that's about 40% of the person's body weight, and the extracellular uh, compartment where 20% of your body weight is due to fluid. Now the extracellular compartment's divided two ways. Three quarters of the fluid is in the interstitial space around the cells, and one quarter exists in the plasma, or in the intravascular space. Now as we, go, as we grow, the percentage water in the body changes. So as an infant, your full-term infant has 80% of their body weight as water. Now this is all related to the body mass compared to the body surface area, so that's why that number is so high in infants. Uh, in adults, it drops down to 60%. Um, and adult values uh, actually start at puberty. So once you get to puberty, you're considered an adult for this purpose. I know I've got my daughter's 21 and she says she's an adult and she really is uh, lacking in that. So this is just for uh, this purpose. Now if you look at the composition of the human body, skeletal muscle has more water than fat. So lean individuals have a higher percent of their body weight as, fat, as water than fat individuals. Obese people, your water content may be reduced to about 45%. And then as you age, the amount of skeletal muscle cells decrease. And so uh, your percent of, wa of, of your weight as water decreases as well. And if you, can have, if you have an obese elderly patient, your uh, percent of, uh, of body uh, weight as water can drop down to the 40% category. One of the reasons why elderly patients tend to get more dehydrated more easily than younger patients is because they actually have this lower percentage of weight as body water. Now, how do we maintain this balance? Well, we have the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. Uh, specialized cells called juxtacomerular cells uh, in the kidney will excrete renin, and renin is excreted as a response to low blood volume or low blood pressure. Now the renin will go to the liver where it converts angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 then goes to the lungs where it's converted from angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2 by angiotensin converting enzyme. And so angiotensin 2 is actually a vasoactive substance that causes vasoconstriction. The ACE inhibitor inhibits the change of angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2, so that's how it works for hypertension. It also works for uh, maintaining balance in fluids. So angiotensin II, then along with this vasoactive effect, also will go to the adrenal gland where it stimulates the adrenal to produce aldosterone. Aldosterone will act to retain sodium and water. So that's how the renin, uh, angi or renin system actually boosts the blood pressure. When, it, when you have low blood pressure, you retain sodium and water. Now this is balanced out by atrial natriuretic peptide, which is a cardiac hormone, and the action of atrial natriuretic peptide is exactly the opposite of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So it suppresses renin production, decreases aldosterone production, 
increases the glomerular filtration rate so that will cause more fluid to be lost through the kidney, causing lowering of the blood pressure, and it also causes vasodilation. Now your electrolytes are split into positive and negative ions. The negative ions are anions, mainly in the body are bicarb, chloride, and phosphate, and the main positive ions or cations are calcium, uh, magnesium, sodium, and potassium, and we'll talk about each of those uh, through the course of the, of the lecture. One slide on acid-base balance. Understand that uh, slight imbalances of acids and bases can profoundly affect our metabolism and our essential body functions. Normal pH is between 7.35 and 7.45. Acidosis occurs with a pH of less than 7.35. Very simply, acidosis occurs with an excess accumulation of acid or an excess loss of bases. And if the pH drops below 6.8, it's usually fatal. Now, alkalosis then occurs with a pH of above 7.45. Again, simply, alkalosis occurs when we have an excess loss of acid or an excess accumulation of bases. And that's usually fa fatal when the pH rises above 7.8. All right, which of the following would result in a normal anion gap acidosis? Lactic acidosis, diabetic ketoacidosis, renal tubular acidosis, methanol ingestion. What do you think? So if you don't know anything about this, you know at, at least two of those are, the, are related to the same thing, and that's organic acid. So lactic acid and diabetic ketoacidosis, if they're the same process, uh, they're not going to be the right answer. Uh, methanol ingestion actually results in the same sort of thing, and so the answer is C. All right, the anion gap. It uh, represents uh, anions that are not routinely measured in our blood. So I said bicarb chloride and phosphate are the ones that are routinely measured. The anions that we don't routinely measure are things like sulfates, proteins, organic acids like lactate, lactic acid, and ketones. Uh, to measure the anion gap, we take the sodium and subtract the chloride plus the bicarb. And a normal anion gap is between 8 and 14. In normal anion gap acidosis are things like hyperchloremic acidosis, renal tubular acidosis, and excess loss of bicarb through the biliary tract and through diarrhea. Elevated anion gap acidosis is, again, accumulation of those organic acids, so things like or, uh, or, uh, organic acids, lactic acidosis, ketones and diabetic ketoacidosis, and other organic acids like uh, methanol, which actually acts like an organic acid. All right, let's go through these uh, electrolytes, starting with sodium. Sodium is 90% of the extracellular fluid cation. So the concentration of sodium is higher in the extracellular fluid than it is in the intracellular fluid. Normally, serum sodium is between 135 and 145, and the normal intracellular level is only 10. So when we talk about potassium in the next set of slides, you'll see it's exactly the opposite. The minimal uh, daily requirement for sodium in an adult is between a half and just less than three grams of sodium. It's not a problem because most Americans will consume, consume more than six grams of sodium a day. Now today, when you have your break in the afternoon, we'll probably give you those beautiful big pretzels with salt all over the top of them, and that's because we do not want you to become hyponatremic in these lectures. So, <clears throat> All right, start with low sodium or hyponatremia. Hyponatremia occurs with a serum sodium of less than 135, and that usually occurs when we have an abnormality in antidiuretic hormone and renal function. So that happens because of an abnormality in that. If, if the blood contains more water and less sodium, what happens is we have a passive process called osmosis, whereby water will move into the cells. Water moves into the cells, it causes the cells to swell. So swelling cells in the brain are cerebral edema. And when we would get water into the cells, it comes out of the plasma. So the result there is cerebral edema and hypovolemia. So those are things that we want to avoid. Um, because this uh, causes cerebral edema, you can get depressed levels of consciousness with hyponatremia. And <clears throat> often with mild hyponatremia, people may have just a little bit of confusion, and that's it. But as it gets more and more profound, people will get depressed levels of consciousness, they can get seizures, they can have other focal neurologic findings, which again begin with confusion and progress through the whole spectrum. 
and this can also called, cause an acute respiratory distress syndrome. And all of that happens because of a metabolic encephalopathy as a result of that cerebral edema and increased intracranial pressure. So if we see that, we need to treat it because it can be fatal and it's also irreversible. So we want to treat this early on. So there are various causes of hyponatremia and it depends upon the fluid volume. So you can have hypovolemic hyponatremia, euvolemic hyponatremia, and hypervolemic hyponatremia. We'll talk about those in the next several slides. If you have low volume and hyponatremia, you can either, either have a cause that's renal or you can have a non-renal cause. And we determine which one by looking at a spot urine sodium. So renal causes of, of hypovolemic hyponatremia, again, with excess loss of, of sodium through the kidney with a spot urine sodium of greater than 20, are things like diuretic use. So the most common cause of this process is something that we do to patients ourselves. You can also get it from hypoaldosteronism, from salt losing nephritis, from osmotic diuresis, and from adrenal insufficiency. Now, if the spot urine sodium is less than 20, that indicates a non-renal cause of hypovolemic hyponatremia, and things like vomit, vomiting and diarrhea will cause that. Also, excess loss of sodium with nasogastric suctioning, and you can get this as well in patients who have extensive burns, who have excessive sweating, and have large wounds that drain fluid. So that's all the non-renal causes. You can have hyponatremia with high volume. Now, usually this is dilutional, so your congestive heart failure, renal failure, uh, nephrotic syndrome, and hepatic failure are causes of this. You can also get this by giving too much hypotonic IV fluids. So I know when I was a resident, we used to use, use third normal saline and half normal saline all the time, and using that in higher volumes actually will depress the sodium to a point where it becomes uh, clinically important. You can have hyponatremia with a isovolemic or euvolemic uh, situation. Now, most of the time when you see this, it's actually an undetected hypervolemic condition, so it's somebody who actually has a congestive heart failure and you just didn't detect it beforehand. But you can also see this in the face of renal failure, hypothyroidism, and adrenal insufficiency. And this is also where we see two um, killer foils for the boards, which uh, uh, Ed is going to talk about this afternoon. That's SIADH and psychogenic polydipsia. So SIADH is indicated when the urine osmolality is greater than the serum osmolality. We'll talk briefly about the causes of that in the next slide, but we'll talk about it later in a, another couple of lectures. And then the last one is the psychogenic polydipsia or water intoxication. So this takes a lot of water to be able to dilute out the sodium, about 10 to 15 liters per day. Um, so normally you'll see this associated with individuals who have some psychological dependence upon water, so they just drink it because it's there. Um, but I have also seen this in my role as medical director for the Michigan Breast Cancer 3-Day, which is a 3-day, 60-mile walk in individuals who may be at variable levels of fitness who need to drink fluids in order to stay hydrated because it's in the summer in Michigan. And we provide balanced electrolyte solutions like Gatorade for them, but some people don't like Gatorade, and so they just drink water. And so we will see people with headaches and loss of, uh, loss of uh, orientation after two or three days of just drinking water on this, on this event. So here's SIADH. Various causes include drugs like uh, chemotherapeutic agents are the most uh, often implicated, but antipsychotics can do this as well. And then malignancies is the other big area. So uh, malignancies of the lung, the pancreas, GI tract, central nervous system. You can also get this associated with asthma and COPD, so other uh, lung causes. And you can also get this after CNS trauma or strokes. So all the causes of SIADH. So how do we treat hyponatremia? Well, you want to address the underlying etiology because it will be refractory unless you do. If you have mild to moderate hypovolemic hyponatremia, you give the patient isotonic IV fluids. You give them salt on their food. When's the last time a doctor told a patient to salt their food? But that's how you treat this. And you want to make sure that they drink a lot of oral fluids, especially fluids that are balanced, like Gatorade, for example. So fluids that have some salt in them. 
If you have mild to moderate hypervolemic or iso isovolemic hyponatremia, then what you want to do is cut back on fluids. So you'll restrict the fluids, and then you'll use what's called a dietary renal soluate load, which includes excess sodium, potassium, calcium, and urea to help build up the, hypo, the, uh, the sodium in these cases. If the sodium is very low, so severe hyponatremia, sodium of less than 110, or the patient has neurologic findings associated with their hyponatremia, that's the time when you use hypertonic saline. That's the only time when you use hypertonic saline. We're going to talk in a second about hypernatremia, and one of the common causes is using hypertonic saline when it's not indicated. So you give a small amount of 3%, 100 milliliters over 10 minutes, then another 100 milliliters over 50 minutes should raise the serum sodium up between 3 and 6 milliequivalents. And then you want to use an appropriate rate of fluid replacement so that you slowly increase the sodium. The rate of rise shouldn't exceed more than a half of a milliequivalent per liter per hour. And your final sodium, after you've corrected, you don't correct all the way to 135, you just correct to 130. If you, don't do, the, if you do this too quickly, you can get central pontine myelinolysis, which is an irreversible uh, problem causing flaccid paralysis and death. So you don't want, you want to be very careful when you correct the hyponatremia. Hypernatremia occurs with a serum sodium of greater than 145. If it's severe, it can lead to coma, seizures, and permanent neurologic damage. Again, neurologic findings are com more common with sodium than the other electrolytes. Now, fortunately, most of us have an intact thirst mechanism, and thirst is the body's main defense against developing hypernatremia. So the people that get hypernatremia are the very young or infants, the very old, elderly, and the very sick patients. So those are the ones that you have to watch out for hypernatremia for. Pretty simple. For hypernatremia, you can have excess water loss, you can have inadequate water intake, or you can have excess uh, intake of sodium. And you have to, again, correct this slowly to prevent the cerebral edema caused by shift of the water into the cerebral cells, which, again, can cause neuro permanent neurologic damage. So the first thing you do with hypernatremia is look at the extracellular volume because you have, again, hypovolemic hypernatremia and hypervolemic hypernatremia. Signs of low extracellular volume, weight loss, a low spot urine sodium, hypotension, tachycardia, decrease in urine output, all things that are associated with dehydration. Signs of high extracellular volume, peripheral edema. So pretty common, pretty easy to ass assess the extracellular volume just based on your physical exam. So first, hypovolemic hypernatremia can be caused commonly by excessive use of diuretics. So again, diuretics will cause patients to lose fluid, and if they lose more fluid than sodium, they will become hypernatremia can also get this with vomiting and diarrhea. Diabetes insipidus, another killer foil for the boards, is an uncommon cause of hypovolemic hypernatremia. So how do we treat this? Well, you want to do a two-fold treatment. The first one is you stabilize your vitals with normal saline. Remember, normal saline is actually hyponatremic to the patient's body, so it actually will lower the sodium. And then you want to replace the, the patient's loss of water, so again, to build up their volume, with D5W. So normal saline to stabilize their vitals, replace their water with D5W. All right, hypervolemic hypernatremia. Common cause of this, again, overuse of hypertonic IV fluids. Now remember, it's not just 3% saline. D5 and lactated ringers or D5 normal saline are hypertonic solutions because they are adding the, the sugar actually increases the tonicity of the solution. Uncommon cause of this, primary hyperaldosteronism and Cushing syndrome. So if you're hypervolemic and hypernatremic, the first thing you want to do is get rid of the fluid. So you use diuretics. And then you, this is where you could use hypotonic uh, fluids to try and dilute out the sodium a little bit. And then you look at the underlying cause and correct that. Hypokalemia. All right, we're going to go back to go to potassium. Now, potassium is the, is the uh, ion that causes changes in the EKGs. And I'm going to tell you a little secret on how to remember this as we go along. So hypokalemia is most commonly caused by something we do to patients ourselves, giving them diuretics. 
You can also see this in malnutrition, and you can also see it in patients who have excessive vomiting. So you not only lose potassium in the vomitus, but you lose hydrogen ions, and then the body attempts to normalize the, uh, the pH by driving or by uh, leading to loss of potassium. And so you get hypokalemia associated with volume from that respect. From that respect. Um, often the times when patients have mild hypokalemia, it's asymptomatic. They may start to have some confusion and other mental status changes, and they may exhibit some fatigue. So EKG changes with hypokalemia. Look at the EKG tracing. So you have a P wave, a QRS, and then a T wave, and you want to put an arrow down on the T wave. So hypokalemia down on the T wave flattens the T wave. So when you flatten the T wave, it has to go someplace. So it pushes it out and forms a U wave. So down on the T wave, pushes out and forms a U wave. And you also get a prolonged QT interval. So that may be an easy way to remember that. Low potassium lowers the T wave. So how do we treat this? Well, potassium and magnesium are tied together. And magnesium and calcium are tied together. But potassium and magnesium are tied together. So if you don't replace magnesium, your hypokalemia may be refractory. So most people will give a, a bolus of one to two grams IV of magnesium per uh, in an hour, and then maintenance dose of magnesium along with replacing the potassium. Understand that most potassium is intracellular. So for every 0.3 mill equivalents in your serum uh, potassium below normal, there's a 100 mill equivalents of potassium depleted. So think of that as you're replacing. Uh, the preferred route of replacement of potassium is oral. If you need to do IV, the maximum rate is about 20 mill equivalents per hour in a single IV. If you have multiple IVs, you can do up to 80 mill equivalents per hour, but you need to do EKG monitoring during that. All right, excess potassium, hyperkalemia. The first thing you should do in a patient who has hyperkalemia who has no explained etiology is to repeat the test because drawing blood actually will fracture red blood cells which can liberate potassium and cause a factitious elevation of the potassium. You can also get this in association with renal failure, with all sorts of acidosis, hypoaldosteronism. You can get it after massive blood transfusions for two reasons. One reason is the red blood cells in the transfusion are more friable, and so they'll release potassium. The other reason is that many uh, transfusions use potassium citrate as a preservative, so they'll have that as well. Um, you can get this as a, associated with any sort of injury that lyses cells, so cell death, Rhabdomyolysis from burns or crush injuries can cause this. And then a number of drugs, obviously giving patients potassium supplements can raise their potassium, but also the ACE inhibitors and the angiotensin receptor blockers and the non anti-inflammatories are implicated in hyperkalemia. So look at your EKG this time, and now you've got an arrow pointing up on the T wave. So you point up on the T wave, you get a tall peak T wave. So when you peak the T wave, it's got to come from someplace. It comes from the P wave. So you have a tall peak P T wave and a loss of a P wave. As the potassium gets higher, over 8, you see a widened QRS uh, complex. And then eventually what you'll see is a sine wave. So a prolonged PR interval and then a sine wave. Sine waves associated with hyperkalemia. So how do we treat hyperkalemia? Well, there's two ways you can do it. You can do it short term by driving potassium into the cells. And we do that using albuterol. You do it using insulin plus glucose. Um, and either one of those gives you a short term solution because albuterol will drive uh, potassium into the cells. Insulin also drives it into the cells, but it only lasts as long as the insulin's around or the albuterol's around. Once those are out of the system, then the potassium comes right back out. So you also have to have a long term solution, which is long term removal of the potassium, either through um, dialysis or through using binding agents like K oxalate. Um, the other thing that you can do is put patients on a loop diuretic. Again, using, as we know, that using loop diuretics predisposes individuals for developing hypokalemia, so that's a way to treat the patients. Calcium chloride uh, is used, but only when patients have EKG abnormalities of widened QRS complex. So this is used to stabilize the heart rhythm. All right. Magnesium, which of the following is true regarding st the true statement regarding hypermagnesemia? 
Hyperreflexia is an associated symptom. Impaired renal function is a risk factor. Often associated with hyperparathyroidism is a risk factor for pancreatitis. What do you think? So the, the indecision of the crowd tells me that magnesium is the forgotten ion, and that's true. So we don't really think much about magnesium. Hypomagnesemia uh, normally is caused, again, by something we do to patients, by diuretic use. You can get it associated with malnourishment. You can get it associated with diarrhea. Certain antibiotics can cause this, and again, it occurs in association with hypokalemia. Just like potassium, serum levels of magnesium are inaccurate. And so, because much of the magnesium lies inside the cells, you can have a normal range, but actually have total body depletion of magnesium. So, symptoms of hypomagnesemia are fasciculations, tremors, ataxia, tetany, and seizures. So these are all neurologic effects of having a low potassium. And you can also get arrhythmias with hypomagnesemia. So how do we treat this? Well, remember I said you load the patient with hypokalemia with magnesium. You do the same thing. One to two grams of magnesium over 20 to 60 minutes and then a maintenance dose of 0.5 to 1 gram per hour. Hypermagnesemia. Okay, renal, dis renal dysfunction. So that was the answer to the question. Exclusive to patients with renal dysfunction or iatrogenic causes. So again, giving patients too much magnesium. Um, some of the predisposing conditions are things like hemolysis and renal insufficiency. Patients with hypermagnesemia actually have hyporeflexia, not hyperreflexia. They'll have a prolonged AV conduction, eventually getting complete heart block, and finally asystole. Treat the patient by removing the magnesium with hemodialysis. You can also stabilize the EKG or stabilize the heart rhythm using calcium gluconate. And then you want to wash it out using aggressive volume replacement. Um, hypercalcemia, uh, high calcium usually is associated with things like hyperparathyroidism, with malignancy where we have re, uh, malignant cells replacing uh, cells in the bone marrow for, or in the bone, for example, causing driving of the potassium out into the system, uh, prolonged immobilization, thyrotoxicosis, and a bunch of different medicines. Now you can look at the level of hypercalcemia and determine what the underlying etiology is. So if you have really high hypercalcemia, which is greater than 14 milligrams uh, percent, that's usually a malignant cause. If you have mild hypercalcemia, then that's the variety of causes. So the severe hypercalcemia almost always associated with malignancy. Some of the symptoms and signs of high calcium are things like vomiting, constipation, ileus, polyuria, and then you can get calcium-containing kidney stones along with this as well. So we treat these patients by washing out the calcium using isotonic saline. You can remove calcium through the, through the kidney by using furosemide. And then the long-term treatments to drive the calcium back into the bone using hydrocortisone and bisphosphonates. Hypocalcemia will occur in patients who have prolonged immobilization. So, and also patients, again, this is associated with magnesium. So hypocalcemia and hypomagnesemia exist together. Other things like drugs, uh, transfusions, pancreatitis, hypoparathyroidism, and then a relatively common cause is vitamin D deficiency. These patients will exhibit the neuromuscular excitability, so Schwastex and Trousseau signs that we learned in medical school, and there are also some arrhythmias associated with hypocalcemia. We treat these individuals by treating the underlying cause, and we only give them IV calcium when the patient's symptomatic or when their ionized calcium gets very low, below 1.4 milliequivalents per liter. Um, last one, hypophosphatemia. You can get hypophosphatemia as a result of internal redistribution uh, in cases like acute respiratory alkalosis in the hungry bone syndrome, or you can also get refeeding through increased insulin secretion. You can also get hypophosphatemia through decreased intestinal absorption, especially associated with aluminum and magnesium-containing antacids. And then finally, you can get increased urinary excretion of phosphate through osmotic diuresis in, in diabetic ketoacidosis, as well as in hyperparathyroidism. 
some of the signs and symptoms of hypophosphatemia. Uh, you can get um, central nervous system signs like metabolic encephalopathies. You can get confusion associated with this. It can be associated with congestive heart failure and respiratory failure. You get proximal myopathies with hypophosphatemia. And you can also get thrombocytopenia and other hematologic abnormalities. So most patients who have hypophosphatemia won't need any treatment other than that that's directed at the underlying cause. If you need to replace it, you want to do it orally if, if uh, possible with 2.5 to 3.5 grams of uh, phosphate. In a symptomatic patient, you can add uh, IV phosphate, uh, 2.5 milligrams per kilo over a six-hour period. And that is the end of part two of surgery.